You've hit play on the Screen Companion, an eclectic mix of film and TV recommendations. Joining me today is John. Hey, John. Hey, bonjour. And we're going to do some foreign movies about relationships. Hopefully these films aren't indicative of how the majority of relationships go on in the rest of the world. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Through the foreign lens, here's a look at relationships that I don't think they really do over here. We're going to be talking about The Night Porter from 1974. Je t'aime, moi non plus. Also known as I Love You, I Don't from 1976. And In the Mood for Love from the year 2000. Respectively, one's Italian, another's French, and then we got Hong Kong Chinese at the end there. Guess who chose which one? <laughs> <laughs> We are very consistent. <laughs> Let's start with Je t'aime, moi non plus, which, forgive my terrible French, I'm just going to call it Je t'aime for short. Trying to find this on all the streaming platforms, I just kept getting a million other movies about French love. When you're looking for a movie where somebody recommends something to you and it isn't immediately available, does that give you a positive idea of the experience, or do you go like, oh, no, what's this going to be? It usually is a positive experience because I like talking about movies that no one can find. Just the obscure movie guy at work. It's not a steadfast rule, but I think the more obscure a movie is, the harder it is to find. Typically means it's going to think outside the box. It won't be generic. So this one, J. Tem, it's about, I'm going to say he's a gay trucker <laughs> named Kraski, and he's riding around with his companion Padavan, and they stop in a rural town where Kraski becomes attracted to the tomboyish Johnny at a diner slash truck stop. John, this was your first watch. What were you left feeling when it ended? Kinda did not like this movie at all. <laughs> It felt like French, uh, I don't know what to say, crashness. Um, Crashkiness? Crashkiness, yes. It was very French. I don't know how to describe that. <laughs> it just felt so avant garde, almost. Would it surprise you to learn that the actor who played Krasky is an American? Yes, it would, because he spoke French the whole movie. He was dubbed. Oh. He was a little cross that they dubbed him. He had a big career over in Europe. He did a lot of Andy Warhol stuff. He's been in at least two movies with Udo Kier at his hottest slash freakiest in the 70s. Let's get into the setting of this film. I'm a fan of this movie, but I do find it very silly what they're doing with the location. But where do you think this movie is supposed to be set? A few things happened that were just so French. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could see it being rural America. There's definitely that one weird kid, the balding kid with the long hair. I know, I felt bad for that kid. Was he 12 and he already had a comb over? Like, what's going on there? <laughs> Malnutrition, or he stood next to a radiation plant, I don't know. <laughs> Easily could have been the yeah, yeah. The signs were written in English. And then there was a lot of hillbilly music in the opening. Oh, the music in general. I wrote that down. I was like, what's up with this music? Which is ironic because the director and Jane Birkin, they had a long storied relationship and they were known for collaborating and being music artists. But you don't get that sense from watching this movie. I heard one film critic liken the director to Prince. But I think Prince would have done a better job with the soundtrack. What do you think? Oh, we have proof. Purple Rain. <laughs> we definitely have proof that Prince is a better filmmaker. I know the director wanted to give this small-town USA firmament to the audience, but everything else in it clashes with that. 
I know America doesn't get to monopolize movies set elsewhere, but everyone's speaking the audience's language. However, I shiver to imagine how tone-deaf our stuff must be, considering how silly and off-putting I found this French equivalent. I think the world depicted in Je t'aime is interesting, but has very little basis in reality. Let's call these flicks geographic fiction. It's like science fiction, except the thing that's being made up is a place instead of technology. Uh, that's a very good way to look at it. That makes the movie slightly better, actually. If they are going for Small Town USA, can you point to a detail that really doesn't support that thesis? Uh, <laughs> the random strip show in the middle of whatever this location is. 100%. Everyone's having fun, and there's a band, and it's like a dance party, and all of a sudden the creepy old guy's like, all right, it's time for the strip show, and, like, random volunteers have to come up and strip. <laughs> and the band on stage, I think he's the saxophonist, some wind instrument, but he's not even playing, he's just watching the women strip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. The only guy doing anything is the drummer. The way it starts... I'm seeing a truck, I'm seeing a landfill, I'm seeing a desolate landscape. This could be the Midwest USA, fine. And then they talk about, hey, do you want to go to a dance that's in a barn? Okay, I believe that. Then they have the strip show in the barn. You grew up in a small town. I've lived in a small town. I don't know what these crazy French people are thinking in this movie. Could you imagine if they did that in your small town growing up? It would be a total scandal. It would be. It would be a huge scandal. That just doesn't happen. Because <laughs> there's going to be kids there and all sorts of uh, religious prudes. <laughs> and then whoever volunteers to strip, it must be because that's going to be their last night in town. They're leaving. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, I'm out of here. I'm going to show these people my titties and bounce. <laughs> Because those small towns, people live there forever. Yeah. You don't want to be known as stripper chick with a flat butt. <laughs> <laughs> the director, he actually wanted this movie to play theatrically across the United States. It didn't, and he's nuts to have thought this would have played. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's a crazy person. <laughs> the main actor, Joe D'Alessandro, who played Kraski, the American, in real life, he went to Europe believing he could make it big there and then jumpstart his career and come back to the United States. What he didn't count on is that the movies he did, none of them played here. They were going to release J. Tem in some theaters, but the director was going to have none of it. If you don't play this everywhere, this is not some art house movie. You must play this in every cinema or else no deal. And so they didn't do it, and that was to the consternation of the main actor. He's like, come on, just let some people see it. Yeah, that's, wow. Cutting off his nose to spite his face on that one. <laughs> what else about it comes off as particularly French? <laughs> well, this might just be a weird racism I have, but there was a lot of peeing in this movie, and I felt like urination is a very French thing to have in movies. What other examples can you give me? I haven't really noticed. <laughs> There's a scene where Kraski pees in a field. They show Johnny peeing a couple times, and then I think Padawan, Padawan, I keep on calling him Padawan, <laughs> his little gay Jedi buddy, he peed a few times, and it was just such a weird... French people have peeing in movies a lot for some reason. Can you imagine he goes to the audition, and he looks at the description of his character? Gay Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. The lightsaber's going to be a weird dildo. <laughs> Tangentially related to that about the peeing, I thought the matter-of-fact depiction of sex and nudity seems very French. As sensual as the French can come off, a lot of their movies that I've seen do their darndest to deflate the sexiness of nudity or put it in a scummy context that's going to kill most boners. That's a very good point. That's an actual intelligent it's French point, not my they're peeing a lot point. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they need to come to terms with both. Why all the peeing? <laughs> I think it goes back to your point of it just being that French nonchalantness of just like, it happens, get used to it. Yeah, it's like, here's Johnny's butt. <laughs> I dare you to think it's sexy because she's pissing right now in a field. <laughs> 
She's peeing now, and then she's going to get sodomized later and not enjoy it. We're French. We believe in staying hydrated. It extends to our cinema. <laughs> <laughs> it is healthy. It's no problem. You've never been to France, have you? No, I've not been to France. Okay, neither have I. Letting the audience know, especially the French listeners, which I do know we have some. Ooh. Take our criticisms with a grain of salt. Yeah. <laughs> The Screen Companion is available on multiple platforms, including Podbean, Amazon Music Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and Rumble. Tell us your review, vote for what we should cover next, or let certain guests know they're your favorite via thescreencompanion at gmail.com or by posting on the Screen Companion group on Facebook. Thanks to everyone in the States and abroad for listening. Further support the host by purchasing his novel, Traversal, The Weight of Worlds. Available in both digital and print formats on Amazon.com. Describe the main relationship for me. In what ways do you think it gets real that a typical American Hollywood romance won't? They seem to know what they are doing. There wasn't a lot of actual romance in this relationship as much as it was escapism from their normal lives. Totally, yeah. And I feel like that's a true romance right there, not to uh, be confused with the movie True Romance. Uh, Kraski's cheating on his Padawan with Johnny. But we really don't know the full extent of his relationship with Padawan. It's pretty messed up, given the ending. They're definitely engaging in some kind of relationship beyond being friends. Yeah. Whether they, before the start of the movie, said, I'm going to commit myself to you, I just don't know how far they've defined it. Maybe I am looking too much into their relationship. No, no, look as much as you want to. It's there to be looked at. Padavan was definitely not okay with Kraski's relationship with Johnny. As a prank, he tries to kill Johnny. He tries to suffocate her with a plastic bag that he's had the whole movie. I'll give that to the filmmakers. That was a good little Chekhov's gun, that plastic bag he had the whole movie. This is only the second time I've ever seen it, and this time, it occurred to me just how often he's playing with that bag. At some point, I think my wife's like, why does he even have that? What's with the bag? And I was like, that's a good point. I know why. He always has the bag. It's like his quiet assassin's tool. It's his piano wire hidden in his watch. Hidden in plain sight. Oh, wow, Padawan, um, that's kind of weird. You got a plastic bag. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> it's just a prank. Do not worry. <laughs> Can we agree that had Kraski not interceded, Johnny would have been killed? Yes, we can agree on that. Padawan had murder in his heart and hate in his eyes, and he was there for that. I felt bad for Padawan until he tried to kill her. He was the victim of a hate crime earlier in the movie. Right after that, they played upbeat music, which was really weird. He was the victim right up until he became an attempted murderer. And it worked. He got Kraski back. That's true. But I don't think Kraski was ever fully into his relationship with Johnny anyway, so it wouldn't have taken much, but maybe the plastic bag was too far. Yeah, I don't think he was that much into Johnny either, considering all the uh, quote-unquote lovemaking scenes were just painful sodomy. Johnny and Kraski. They feel like a perfect example of how relationships can be less about what each partner can do for the other and more about selfishness. I see Johnny as someone who gets mistaken for a guy a lot, and maybe it's because I'm watching this in 2023. I think she's dealing with some gender issues. So she goes out with a homosexual man to reinforce this fantasy of living as a male. Then you got Kraski who I'd say is in denial over his sexuality. He dates a girl to prove that he's not 100% gay. It's almost the reverse of Chasing Amy. It is the reverse of Chasing Amy. I don't believe either of these two characters is in the relationship concerned with what the other one wants. It's a means to an end for each of them. And in that way, it goes against traditional Hollywood love stories that present a perfect ideal of two people caring about each other. In real life, there's probably a lot more how do I feel versus how do I make my partner feel. I don't think either of them actually cared about the other's opinion. I keep bringing up the painful sodomy. 
But that was, I think, a big example of Kraski can't, he wouldn't be doing that. There's other ways. Did you want the couple to have a happy ending? Given how everything went down, this was the happy ending. Johnny gets to live, not dealing with Kraski anymore. It sucks she's still stuck at that truck stop restaurant, living with that weird guy. With that gigantic coffee machine. Huge! Which is obviously French. That's super French coffee machine. Absolutely. I think she was too immature, and he was too self-centered. I'm glad they didn't stay together. Yeah, that is the happy ending. <laughs> yeah. The relationship aside, is there a subplot or some other aspect of the film that held your attention? With the exception of Padavan, all the other side characters just kind of came and went. There was those kids that they dumped out of the back of the dump truck, and their ending was that they got to beat up Padavan. And was the implication that all small-town American males are secretly harboring gay feelings? I kind of felt that way. <laughs> uh, Would you like to respond to that as a small-town American? That's probably true. It's probably 100% true. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hug this dude, so I'm going to beat him up just so I can touch him. <laughs> What's up with Gerard Depardieu? <laughs> Literally this big dude on a white horse. <laughs> yeah, he got like wandering in and out. It was so weird. Is that the guy from the Jet Li movie? In some ways, this felt more psychosexual than the Night Porter. <laughs> I don't think he was real. I think he was a manifestation of probably Johnny's, like, ultimate gay person <laughs> she was looking for. Holy crap, John, you're right. That makes the movie a little more interesting to me, because I believe every time we see Depardieu, isn't Padavon there? Yeah. He's at the barn, and he's watching women strip. He's riding alongside the truck right before they dump their passengers out of the truck bed. Obviously, Padavon and Depardieu meet in the field. It's like Depardieu wrote part of the script. I really want to get across in this scene that I have a big penis. How do we do that? <laughs> well, we'll just have you tell the guy that you would F him except for the fact that you put him in the hospital because your dog's too big. <laughs> <laughs> it just clearly says that. Because uh, the horse, the horse wasn't metaphorical enough. <laughs> What do you think they intended with that scene? Because I think it sounds like, for us, it came off as very humorous. That's, I think, another one of those, this is clearly a French movie, where <laughs> all the characters have that weird sense of life is absurd, so why take it serious type of nihilism, I guess? Even though telling people you have a large penis is not nihilism at all. Stuff like that and the strippers in the barn, I can understand some other perspectives that foreign cinema brings to the table, but moments like that, I can't cross that divide, French guys. I don't get what you mean. <laughs> uh, yeah, agreed. If an American goes around telling people he has a big penis, the first thing you're going to say is, well, if you're saying it, it's not true. I expected him to whip it out. <laughs> It's a French movie, you know? They have nudity all over the place. Show us, Gerard. Let's see it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there was a penis or two earlier in the movie. Oh, there were. There were. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, with all the nudity, I was like, Frank, how much do you love this movie? Um, more than I should. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it really is just how messed up the relationship is. I haven't experienced this too much myself. Like I said before. People are in a relationship, and it only feels like they're in it for what it gives them. They could give two craps about how the other person's feeling. It's true. I really liked the imagery. The sun-baked scenery and visuals that stand out in spite of their negative connotations. Like the landfill scenes, the dusty, desolate roads. Whatever the hell that scene at that dry goods store was about. When she's buying stuff for the truck stop. Horse meat. Yeah, that was the weirdest. <laughs> I just needed the horse meat. That whole weird scene where he eyeballing it and then he happens to be right. Was he just keeping raw horse meat under the counter? It looked like it. <laughs> What's the shelf life of that? I don't think he was in a cooler. Um, not long. Um, legally. <laughs> legally, like three, four hours. Was horse meat a thing where you grew up? No. 
I don't remember anybody selling horse meat when I was living in a small town. That's another example of, did the director think that's what it's like in America? Or is he making fun of us? Both. At that point, it's both, right? If he thought that's what it was, he's wrong and he's making fun of Americans. Or he's making fun of Americans. So it's either way. What was your favorite scene or performance? I was going to say that I liked Johnny because I get where she's coming from with the whole, the small town sucks, that guy sucks, here's something new. But you reminded me about Gerard Pepperdu. Pepperdu. <laughs> <It's> just <laughs> I completely forgot about how hilarious he was. Gerard Pepperidge Farm. Yeah. <laughs> Papa Don. <laughs> Papa John's Big Sausage Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> There's a moment. I really enjoy for its ability to morph from sexy to funny that encapsulates what French movies can do when they're doing it well. It's a scene of a close-up of Johnny eating bananas and cream. The first time she does it, and Kraski's watching her, it's flirtatious, a little sexy. Then the moment stretches out, and she's on her fourth banana, and it becomes so comedic that they've made their point. <laughs> But by now, it's lost its sexiness, and we're simply watching a girl eat. There are two shots. It cuts from her to him for his reaction. Otherwise, it's just a close-up of her sucking on bananas. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. Not as sexy by the end of it as it sounds. Now we're getting to the part you've been waiting for. Give me, like, your top three biggest criticisms. Number one, the music did not fit that movie at all. It should have been in like a weird, quirky comedy, but it was in this movie. Those weird-looking kids committed the hate crime on Papadon. Or not Papadon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Padavon. Padavon. Um, I get confused with all these French names. If you want to call him the Italian, you can do that. I'll call him the Italian. That's right, he did say he was from Italy. Another detail that makes no sense in small-town America. Oh, no, yeah. No one's from other places. Because they're smart enough not to come to these places. <laughs> yeah, foreigners don't just show up, small towns, and be like, I shall live here now. Yeah, I want to go to Dead End USA. I want to be poured out of my skull for the rest of my life. That's why he was hallucinating Gerard. Because <laughs> he was bored out of his skull. Uh, so there's that scene where those weird-looking kids committed a hate crime on Padavan, and then immediately after, there's just really upbeat music playing. woo doo 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 it would be like, you should feel good about this. We just committed a hate crime. Feel good, audience. I think that's a example of lower-budget movies. They make a couple of music compositions, and then they just play them to death. I counted one piece of music in this movie that played six times in a movie that doesn't even crack 90 minutes. Give me silence or the sounds of the background instead of that repetitive frickin' score. Something. Anything. What's your second bone to pick? They felt like the movie wasn't long enough, so they just started adding gratuitous nudity. I can't believe I'm complaining about nudity, but none of it made sense. Uh, well, point to one scene. Well, we talked about the stripping scene. What did that add to the movie? A feeling of unease, letting us know that everybody in this town is despicable. I guess... <laughs> It felt like every 90s comedy that ever made fun of foreign films, it felt like this was the movie they were making fun of. Huh. But what about the nudity in the Johnny Kraski scenes? Did you find any of them unimportant? Not really. I wouldn't say unimportant. It was more laissez-faire. Oh, we're going to go to this weird, disgusting swimming hole with this tire. We don't have swimwear, so we're going to be naked. With how mundane and realistic sex can be portrayed in French films, am I supposed to think Kraski performed anal sex on Johnny without lube? What would they have access to in small town? I guess USA? Bacon grease? Bacon grease. Spit? <laughs> Spit at least, yeah. I mean, something. That detail feels like it wouldn't be a problem for this French movie to depict, yet we never see him use any. I don't think he ever does, which makes the unpleasantness of those scenes where Johnny is screaming in pain even worse. 
I don't want anyone to come off as the villain, but it makes Kraski hard to sympathize with. Yeah, he's definitely the villain of this. He's playing Johnny, he's played a Padavan. Every time he speaks of the old dude, uh, Boris... Uh, another small town USA name. Yeah, another, yeah, very... <laughs> very uh, I remember going to school with at least four Borises. <laughs> Did they do any research before they wrote the script? <laughs> no, they didn't do any research. <laughs> Their advisor for Americanisms was probably some Parisian charlatan. Yes, I've been to America many times. <laughs> <laughs> of course. They eat the horse meat. What do we name this guy? Boris, Padavon, Kraski. It's a totally American name, fellas. Use it. Pure American. <laughs> In terms of what would help the movie, I wouldn't have minded a coda that would have had Johnny reflecting on the experience. Maybe at the diner counter, talking with Boris, and we get a taste of her maturing and learning about herself. The way this movie ends, it's a downer I saw coming. I do like the ending, though, for the way it brings all the elements together in a messed up, trashy, soap opera fashion. You're right, that would have helped the movie way more, because she almost looks pathetic being, uh, please don't leave me for this guy who is pranking me by trying to murder me. But we're just left with her crying in a fetal position, naked. I could have used another emotion to go out with. Anything other than that, Andy? Let us move on to In the Mood for Love. John, tell us about it. About two neighbors who form a bond because they've discovered that their partners are cheating on them with each other. They form a bond over the fact that they are victims of unfaithfulness. It gets to be a pretty heavy bond. It does, to the point where they almost become unfaithful themselves. How would you describe this relationship between Mrs. Chan and Mr. Chow, and what about it feels unique versus the majority of our movies? I think that the only thing they have in common is this very powerful emotion of being cheated on. That's ultimately why I don't think it works out for them. Hollywood's going to make sure they get the riding off in the sunset together thing. I'm going to disagree with you that they only have that one thing in common. That's certainly the inciting incident. I found them both very polite and calm, stoic. They look like two peas in a pod to me. Maybe. They did talk about how they both loved that serialized kung fu story from the paper. Martial arts story, I guess. Right. I wish there were more details like that. That was a fun little aside. I appreciated that the two main characters, they're very stoic when they find out their spouses are cheating. And in American stuff, it's going to have them banging on doors, yelling to the sky, Why did he or she do this to me? But that's not always the reaction, right? Sometimes people find out they're being cheated on, and for whatever reason, they just go into themselves. Yeah, they shut down, I guess. Which isn't a cinematic, but it feels more realistic. In this case, did you want the couple to have a happy ending? Yes, I did. Very much so. I love this movie, and I like these two characters. I like the actors, too. Tony Lorang and Maggie Chung. All so heartbreaking, because it's an actual love story, right? It's also heartbreaking that it just happened to two good people. If they released an alternate cut of this movie that had ten more minutes focusing on one of them, who would you want to take those minutes? Probably Mrs. Chan. I feel like Mr. Chow, we get more of Mr. Chow. We know what his job is, we know what his aspirations are. Mrs. Chan's just a secretary? It'd be nice to know more about her. The relationship aside, is there a subplot or some other aspect of the movie that held your attention? Mr. Chow's friend there who kept getting into gambling trouble? I wanted to know more about that. I don't think they finished his story. That really struck me as being honest in the depiction of, I guess I'm going to call them friends. One guy seems like such a screw-up, and the other guy is so straight-laced. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be friends, but they are. Yeah, they should not be friends. I think it was early in the scene when he uh, wanted a hat from Mrs. Chan, and he's like, well, I could get it for you, and I'll just bring it in. And he's like, no, no, I'm coming to your house, because I want to meet her. I heard she's hot. Creeper. 
And when the bald dude's like, I lost my shirt gambling. Give me some money, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he just came in there and said, I just need $300. I liked Mrs. Chan's outfits. The high-collar dresses are great, but probably a bitch to wear when it's hot outside. Oh, yeah. Every time she wore a new dress, I spent time to admire the patterns and colors. They were very opulent. I don't say the whole movie was opulent, but there was a lot of care put into everything you saw. I do believe you that this movie's very deliberate. I think that deliberation could have been better executed. Mm. But before that, what was your favorite scene or performance? The scene when they're practicing, Mrs. Chen and Mr. Chow are practicing calling out Mrs. Chen's husband for being a cheater. Because <laughs> at first, the way they shoot it, first you think she is talking to her husband, and then it does turn out to be Mr. Chow, and they're just practicing it. And I found that quite amusing. I really like that. The way they edited this movie, I wasn't sure if it was intentionally ambiguous at times, like in that scene, or if they should have had a better editor, because then in some scenes I felt like there wasn't ambiguity in the actual scene happening, but the transitions were off-putting. Some of it seemed unmotivated. Did you deal with that at all? Uh, no. I was going to talk about how much I like the choreography and cinematography. I don't know what teachers you had in film school, but every single teacher I had brought this movie up when describing the frame-within-a-frame aspect of shooting a movie. There's your frame, as what you see, and then if something else within a movie makes another frame to draw your attention, that's called a frame-within-a-frame. In the instance of this movie, it is literally door frames <laughs> a lot, because it is almost a claustrophobic movie. Bunch of foreground obstructions. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely has its place, using it as a tool to draw your attention to something in the frame. Mm -hmm. But how much this movie uses it, at a certain point, I felt the claustrophobia was losing the larger fact that, okay, half of this, well, I don't think it was ever half the frame, but I did see a lot of moments, I think they were doing the rule of thirds. A third of this frame is a shelf. I want to see more in the frame, damn it. I don't want to see this blurry blob taking up the screen, and then what I want to focus on, the main actors talking in the background or in the midground. There's very little of them in the shot. But when it's working, which it sounds like those moments worked for you more often than not, what drew you into those moments? Why did it come off as a good thing to you in the cinematography? Especially with foreign films, you always have to pay attention to the uh, subtitles. It was nice to have something to draw the eye back up to the movie, with the way everything was framed and shot. I found it visually interesting, and apparently you find it visually distracting. Agitating. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall there being many close-ups in this movie, were there? All the close-ups seemed to be of hands, and that was about it. Everything else was the best-case scenario, like a chest up shot but not a lot of like extreme eyes this movie if you had to describe its temperament the way it's presented also the main couple would you say it runs hot or cold or it's not really hot but it's not cold lukewarm i guess <laughs> but another word for lukewarm is tepid it came off as the type of movie where the ideas are put forth, and if you're really grabbed by them, then that's going to sustain you through the picture. But if you don't immediately buy into it, like luckily I've never been cheated on, but my life's not over yet. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> I could see how somebody who has had that happen to them would dial into this picture probably immediately the moment it's revealed. But if not, and you're more looking into it like you're looking in somebody's window... I found the acting just so flat. They're so stoic. Uh, I never got any big, passionate feelings from this movie. Even though I wanted to, even though I feel like the actors were more than capable of giving it to me, but it seemed like something that the director said, hey, we're going to be very low-key about this tragedy. I can see that coming from Carwon Kai. He doesn't really do scripts. He's a guerrilla filmmaker. He doesn't like to go get permits or anything like that. He just kind of shows up and <laughs> makes a movie. 
And so it's possible that the uh, actors just didn't even have anything written down. They were just told their lines and had to repeat them. Because of my adverse reaction to this movie, I did have to look into the director. The only other thing of his I'd seen was that other romance. Uh, it had the ingenue. I think she was working at... She was kind of like Johnny. <laughs> uh, Chunk King Express? Yes, that. Oh, I like that one too. You probably hated that, huh? I liked it more than this. I'll say that much. Oh, really? I watched it in college. It might have even been somebody in our friend group that recommended it to me. Um, Ben? Did you know Ben? It could have been Ben. It could have been Ben. It's probably Ben. As much as you love this movie, what is your biggest criticism? I'll agree with you on the acting. It wasn't as fiery hot as I kind of wanted it to be, but I still thought it was good acting. Tony Lang and uh, Maggie Cheng are great actors. If Jaytem has taught us anything, this movie needed a no lube anal sex scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's because two modest Hong Kong residents of the 60s were going to get into unlubed anal sex. The time in which this movie is supposed to take place, I could definitely see spouses getting cheated on, and then for appearances' sake, or because of whatever decorum they think they should maintain, they're not yelling at their spouses or telling everybody in the building, hey, did you see what my scumbag husband just did? He cheated on me all this time. So that feels real, but it's not very cinematic. <laughs> Sorry. No, don't be sorry, John. That's what this show is for. To expose each other to things that make us cringe. Oh, good, because I was cringing the whole last movie. <laughs> <laughs> for good reason. <laughs> so this is my first time seeing In the Mood for Love, and this is where I admit to you and the audience, I don't get how it has such a great reputation among cinephiles. If we weren't doing this for the pod, and if you weren't my only guest this show, I would have shut it off. I would have had more fun watching an old Microsoft screensaver for 90 minutes. Dang, dude. Who hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> the director of this movie hurt oh me God. unintentionally. <laughs> God, my God. You gotta be... Uh, there's a really funny interview between him and John Woo, where John Woo just... He doesn't interview him as much as he talks about how envious he is of him as a filmmaker, and he wishes he made movies like his. Oh, I envy the guy totally. He's made a bunch of movies. I've made zero movies. So yes, I want his career. I'll take it. Movie making? In college, I would hope it's better on a professional level. It was awful in college. Everything, everything always went wrong because nobody cared about you. <laughs> everything I've seen in Hollywood podcasts, that's pretty much how it is. It's just some people like that and other people don't see that as a career. <laughs> The biggest thing that drove me up the wall is the shot choices. Lots of framing that focuses on torsos, over the shoulder, obscured faces. Cinema is a visual medium, so don't do all these scenes where people are talking and I don't get to see the acting. Oh great, the back of that dude's head. Real interesting. And then I mentioned the blurry foreground objects. There's one blurry shot of a wall before the angle switches and it's revealed to be a restaurant booth. I didn't see the point of that ambiguity. Just show me the restaurant. The blurry booth wall isn't doing it for me. I counted so many wasted, boring shots that made this 100-minute film feel like three hours in quicksand. <laughs> I'm not against recurring themes and imagery, but the number of times they show a clock face had me wanting to punch the screen. By the third time that clock came on, I got this lazy vibe that masquerades as high art. A clock. What does it mean? Not interested yet? How about the eighth clock shot? Have you finally imbued it with your own meaning? Here's your chance, John. Can you start with that damn clock? <laughs> it's an editing technique of shape recognition. <laughs> when you cut, you don't want the cut to be too hard. A good example would be like, I don't think it happened in speed, but we're going to say it happened in speed. Time's running out, and they show the clock, and then they cut to a tire that's also the same shape on the bus, and then that's how you establish that you're now in the bus. But that's match cutting. I don't recall that type of thing being used with the clocks in this. 
Is it like in sitcoms where every new act, we do a shot of the Cheers bar exterior, and then we go into Cheers? Like start with the familiar and then continue forward? Is that what it's about? It could be. I love his movies. I don't want to get into the director's head too much because it's probably a weird place. <laughs> I need you to get into the weirdness for me. Oh, God. No. Um, I don't want to dislike the movie. If you can change that for me, by all means. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what happened on set? Because like I said, it's all guerrilla filmmaking. He just kind of shows up to a place and makes a movie. And sometimes he has to rush a bunch of stuff. And he doesn't write anything down. I don't think he makes the movies up when he gets there, but he definitely doesn't have a lot planned out. So the clock, that might have just been random B-roll that the editor rolled with. But the clock doesn't bother you. No, the clock doesn't bother me. What bothers me is your attitude, mister. <laughs> well, I don't, I, I don't think any shot or theme is so important that you would need to repeat it that many times. And I don't think any of the movies in this episode are innocent of what we mentioned with JTEM, which is the repetition of motifs, the music. There was one or two cues in this movie that I heard like six times. It's like, God damn it, stop it. <laughs> yeah. It's not a John Williams score. That was the same, the same with JTEM. But the music fit more. But it's still the same. It is, you're right, it's still the same complaint. <laughs> How about all the slow motion? Never bothered you? I, that did, actually. But I couldn't tell if it was, like, the frame rate of my TV going weird. It was probably they wanted the shot to be longer, and they didn't have enough footage. I would accept that more. I actually thought it was the director wanting to hold on it, because it's just so impactful. And let's take this five-second shot of the actress staring off into space. Let's stretch that into 20 seconds. Enjoy. Because there was one slow-mo scene where she's just picking her shoes up off the floor, and it's shot from underneath the bed. Yeah. Uh, this director apparently doesn't use a script when he's shooting. I think that explains why In the Mood for Love plods as much as it does. It feels so self-indulgent on the director's part, like he was thinking about working through some childhood memory and forgot that there's an audience there to entertain or engage with. That happens with a lot of directors. It does. He's not unique in that regard. The biggest example I can give of this that had me so upset, but luckily it was near the very end, so by that point, it's like, you already killed me, and now you're just pumping a few more holes into my body. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's when Mr. Chow goes to a monastery, he finds a tree, and whispers into a hole. Earlier, he describes an old practice of, if you want to keep secrets, whisper them into a hole in a tree and cover it with mud. When he does that at the end of the movie, John, do we get to hear what he said? No. Of course not. <laughs> at this point in the movie... It's years after his relationship with Mrs. Chan. <laughs> For all I know, he whispered, I contracted herpes, don't tell anyone. There's so little dialogue, and so much of them staring off into space in slow motion. Now I want to do a bit where you just come up with random stuff he could have said into that hole. Random stuff and be like, I wasn't sad when Hitler died. <laughs> <laughs> he could have totally said that. <laughs> I can't refute it, nobody can. Right? If the director did start with any script, it must have been 30 pages, because all the lines said something like, She looked at him for a long time. Then, with a blank expression, he looked back at her for even longer. Is it bad acting, or are you being face racist? If I were to transcribe the movie into a script for you, and I do have some experience with writing scripts... <laughs> oh, really? I don't think it would be more than 40 pages, if that. There's no way it was a long... It's probably a Curb Your Enthusiasm plot outline where it's mostly... Then they're going to ad-lib, but this is what we want the scene to be about. The lack of substantive dialogue. Why couldn't they let us listen to what he said into that frickin' tree? Not that I cared at that point. My first rebuttal question would be, then, how did you feel about at the end of Lost in Translation? I'm going to have to recuse myself from that, because I've only seen it one time at the theaters when I was, I think, like 13. 
Is the movie that old or are you that young? That movie is either late 90s or very early 2000s. Came out 2003. It is why people think Scarlett Johansson's a good actress. But you don't remember the end of that film where Bill Murray whispers something into Scarlett Johansson's ear and we, the audience don't get to hear it? Oh, I'm remembering now, yes. Yeah, because the internet went crazy about that. They loved it, and they were trying to like, what did he say, what did he say? Lost Translation came out after The Mood for Love, I'll have you know. Now that you're reminding me, I don't recall loving that moment, no. Okay, as long as you're consistent. My rebuttal to your whole criticism is, I think you're dead inside, Frank. Hey, I want to engage with these characters. And then with things blocking the shots and then not even getting to hear what he says, it's the director saying, Screw you, Frank. I don't care that you want to know more about these people. I'm going to show you and let you hear nothing. Deal with it. <laughs> Let's move on to The Night Porter. So it's Vienna, 1957. A hotel porter, Max, gets recognized by a guest, Lucia, as an SS officer that fixated on her when she was a teenage prisoner at a concentration camp. Instead of turning him into authorities, they resume their daddy-dom relationship, unable to extricate from one another even as Max's cabal of ex-Nazis see the pair as a threat to their anonymity. What do you think is the most disturbing aspect of this movie? Um, Nazis. <laughs> like... Really more disturbing than the sex stuff? Well, the sex stuff was weird, but that's very Italian, right? It's back to that part of Europe being okay with all of it. <laughs> I have seen that happen a lot in European movies. I don't know. I don't know if that's really true, because I've met some Europeans that are very conservative. But then you watch these movies, and you'd think they're all into orgies. Every time they cut back to the actual concentration camp, it was weird. Oh, it was, yeah. Do you think that how grossly pale they were in the flashbacks, were they meant to look sickly, or was it the director's attempt to artificially drain the color out of those flashbacks? Um... I think it was the director's attempt to, yeah, trade color out of flashback, give it some artistic difference between modern day and flashback, something to denote that it is, in fact, not what's happening right now. Okay, so it wasn't the only one, but those flashbacks, everybody looks so greasy, it's hard not to see what they were doing. I don't think it fit very well. Uh, no, the whole how... I guess how the Italians thought things went down in a concentration camp <laughs> didn't fit well at all. What did they portray in those flashbacks? One of them was a ballet dancer. A Nazi ballet dancer. Nazi ballet dancer in nothing but his undie pants. Hey, was that guy supposed to be a closeted homosexual? I guess. Not something that would fly in Nazi Germany. <laughs> Or, considering how eccentric that cabal is, maybe that's just to show that they don't stick to all their principles and they could overlook him being gay. It could, I guess. It was just weird. Just the general, why are they stopping while one of the officers does a ballet routine? What was the other flashback where they're all wearing weird cloud masks and one of the prisoners is doing a cabaret? <laughs> it almost looks like a retro eyes wide shut. Yeah, yeah, it's really weird. <laughs> Take this a little further. In that scene in particular, which is like this iconic moment in the movie, it's on every poster and Blu-ray cover, Lucia, who is supposed to be a teenager at this time, mm -hmm. she sits down with Max, who's in his Nazi regalia. What does he give her as a present? A severed head of someone that was mean to her, right? Way ahead of its time, you thought you were going to see Gwyneth Paltrow in that box. <laughs> no, it was a dude's head. <laughs> David Fincher loves Italian cinema. He probably loves this movie. Besides the effed up romance, what other genres could you ascribe to this movie? 
intrigue, I guess? And I don't want to say thriller, but there's a definite undertone of that something bad could happen to the characters because of their past. Definitely some spy stuff. Lukewarm thriller. Thriller, but you kind of like, you're not that thrilled, so... Uh... No, I wouldn't say I was thrilled during any of this movie. <laughs> to go back to your, it was only two hours, but it felt like four hours of quicksand. <laughs> Describe for me Max and Lucia's relationship. I thought about The World is Not Enough a lot with that relationship between the girl and the bad guy. Oh, okay. The similar, um, what, Stockholm Syndrome vibes? That's a watered-down version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Robert Carlyle and Sophie Marceau. Yeah. It's a different dynamic. <laughs> I see some parallels, yeah. This guy's evil, but it's not quite Stockholm Syndrome either, is it? Well, I'm going to say that Lucia, she starts for sure as a victim. She's a political prisoner at this concentration camp. Who knows what her life, how normal it could have been had she not been sent to this crazy camp where there are a bunch of weird Nazi officers. And Max, who pretends to be a doctor so he can take movies and photographs of camp prisoners. Yeah. So I feel for her in that regard. But there are some moments in this where she is as complicit as he is in some dirty dealings. And she comes off unhinged herself, I would say. What do you think? I'll agree with that. I was thinking about how little of a victim they show her to be. Even though she is a victim of everything, the Nazi regime. Um, she doesn't come off as a victim. She does come off as cohort. Instead of doing flashbacks, if the camp scenes was the movie, then portraying the victimhood of it would have made more sense. But since this ultimately is some gross romance between those characters, I think they showed less of that with her because it goes completely against their attraction to each other <laughs> for most of the movie. Yeah. I think this is a perfect example of a couple that's so infatuated with each other, they disregard all reality that tells them it won't end well. Mm -mm. Physical and mental health go out the window like they're a couple of junkies that know they're in a death spiral, but don't care because they're doing it together. Yeah. On the one hand, I think that sort of devotion is beautiful. There are moments where both of them remain loyal against their own self-preservation. But anyone else can see it's messed up and would be better not existing. I don't know. I thought it had a happy ending. <laughs> I think a hopeless romantic could appreciate that ending. I met her again. A little girl. You mean the little girl from then? I found her again. I found her again. And no one must touch her. Who dream of touching her? Oh, Max, be careful. Before she could testify against you, you should file her away. I love her. What a madman. She was my little girl. She was very young. And now she's not. She's exactly the same as she was for me. I've never seen you so much in love. I thought she was dead. What a romantic story. As far as aspects of their weird relationship, when I was trying to figure out the right term for it and came up with Daddy Dom, there's an unsettling moment where they're together and they can't, just like in JTEM, they can't have conventional sex scene. Lucia is sucking on Max's nipple. And I think that really shows their dynamic that it is some weird infant fantasy for her and he is the daddy and mommy yeah he's the dom they make people that suck on nipples and have their nipples sucked they give those people a bad name that they don't deserve <laughs> <laughs> well yeah because one of them's a literal nazi <laughs> is there anything you can point to that feels italian or otherwise foreign in this filmmaking I guess everyone smokes, right? Yeah, that's true. 
felt like the film was like maybe 20 minutes longer than it needed to be because there was a lot of just reflection in characters or they just sat around. At first I was like, oh, it's letting the movie speak for itself and they're not hitting it with too much dialogue. And then after it's just like, ah, oh, it's too much existentialism for the sake of the filmmakers being Italian. A lot of superfluous shots. I can think of one where if I'm the editor and I'm looking for things to cut and there are things to cut in this movie. Mm-hmm. There's a moment where Max is putting down placemats on a giant table before a cabal meeting. I don't need that. We don't need to see him setting it up. Yeah, we don't. Did you ever hear this uh, at the Academy of uh, enter a scene late and leave it early? This film did the opposite. It always showed up early. It was awkward, like when you show up to parties early. And then it overstayed its welcome. Each scene overstayed its welcome. But is that a foreign thing, or is that just a 70s cinema thing? Given how much it happened constantly, I think it's a combination of both multiplying on each other. Like, I don't want to get too far onto a tangent. I've only seen Taxi Driver once. I feel like there's a great, great movie in that, but when I saw it, I didn't like the editing. I thought it was too slow. That can be a strength at times, so that we can breathe with the characters. That only works if I can fill in the blanks and feel invested, like I know what the character's thinking about. But when he's putting down those placemats, I have no idea what he's thinking about. It doesn't matter what he's thinking about either, because at that point, what, he's just doing his job as a concierge. <laughs> Gotta set the table, doop a doop. Yeah, he might have been singing Baby Shark in his head at that point. <laughs> <laughs> just to distract himself from the mundanity of it. <laughs> if I didn't mention it was directed by Liliana Cavani, would you have suspected it had been directed by a woman? No, not at all. One thing that felt unique to the movie compared to the other two we've discussed is its use of classical music during the, question mark, erotic scenes between the tragic lovers. Mm-hmm. But I'm not convinced that's because it was a woman directing. That's not a woman. I don't know that aspect of how she's going to view things mentally versus how a man would. I'd like to think she made Lucia there less of a victim, whereas male director probably would have made her full-on victim. She has a lot of agency, but it's so terrible to see the way she exercises that agency. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't give up Max to the authorities. He chains her to his room, and she goes along with it. Yeah. At a certain point in the movie, he basically says, look, we need to hide in my flat. We can't go outside. Ration your food. And she's just okay with it. When I'm pretty sure, had she protested more, I think Max would have let her go. Do you think he would have let her go? No, because he knew she wasn't going to give him up. That's not why he was chaining her up. He was protecting her from the other Nazis. What kind of monster do you think Max is? He's a Nazi. <laughs> That's, uh, he's a Nazi pretentious filmmaker. This is like the two top two worst kinds of scum you can be. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing worse is maybe throw pedophile in there. That's the only thing that would make him worse. He was a pedophile. She was a teenager. I mean, oh my god, he's the worst human being. He's literally genetically engineered to be the worst human being ever. If we could forget that he's part of the Schutzstaffel for a second, was there any other side to the character that you found compelling? No, not at all. He just wanted to do his job and have people forget he was a Nazi, and I felt all his compelling aspects came from the conflict of love versus he was a Nazi. <laughs> Does it make his performance more interesting to you if I say that the actor Dirk Bogard was a World War II veteran, and he had been to a concentration camp. Oh. And that in real life, he was also a closeted homosexual. If they added the closeted homosexual part to the movie, it also would have made it more interesting. Well, who's to say he wasn't? Because at the hotel, he's watching, he's playing, hey, your wife would appreciate this. He's lighting that ballet dancer when he's rehearsing or something or doing a private show for him. That whole scene, how did the ballet dancer get so far up in the SS? <laughs> <laughs> Billy, uh, he hasn't killed any Jews this week, but uh, he can dance so beautifully. We must promote him. I would like to think that it went over their heads 
and all they saw was a really good ballet artist, and they're like, oh, he's Aryan perfection. <laughs> he's basically dancing naked. I liked that scene. You would. Don't kink shame me. Too late. <laughs> As we were talking about, that scene goes on too long. He does like a whole routine in the flashback. I got the point 20 seconds in. I don't need a full minute and a half of this dude dancing. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> by the end of it, there's no point. It's completely deflated. Nothing gets revealed. <laughs> the worst part is it's framed by other dancing. He dances in the room forever. That leads into the flashback of him dancing in the concentration camp forever. <laughs> and then it comes back to the present where he's still dancing. And then then he ends and they have the conversation, which is weird because like, trying to get through these trials is like a weird afterthought to them. Oh, by the way, no new witnesses, right? Yeah, okay. I dialed into the way that Max wasn't deluded into thinking he wasn't a monster during and still after the war compared to those comrades of his. There's one line he says, Sane. Insane. Who's to judge? That gave me some Joker vibes. Sometimes he acknowledges his crimes, but then he comes off as perfectly content in his psychopathy. <laughs> he's happy. I'll agree with he knows he's a monster. They were on a roof or something, and they were all talking, and Max just wanted the conversation to end, so he did the see Kyle, and everyone else did it too, and he's able to just walk away. And you see him rolling his eyes, and I love that moment because he's mocking them. Yeah! He's, he's like, oh, what's the fastest way out of this? I guess hail Hitler, and they're like, yeah, hey, hail Hitler! He's like, alright, bye. I got a lunch date. Because none of them have any guilt over being Nazis, except for him. Yeah, he's the only one with guilt about it, but he also seems to care the least. And it's not going to absolve him of his myriad of sins, but I like when he says to his comrades, why do you think I work at night? Because I don't want to be seen in the day because I hate myself. Mm. That's very Italian. <laughs> Was there any subplot or aspect of the movie that held your attention besides their weird, freaky relationship? <laughs> All the side characters in the hotel. His helper that he sent to, I guess, have sex with the creepy old lady? Oh, yeah. Is that what happened? She was hitting on Max, and he's like, no, thank you. And then he goes and he gets the kid, the sleeping naked kid, and zips his pants up for him. Yeah, he's a gigolo. Yeah, it <laughs> sends him in there. And so the first act, when they introduce all the side characters in the hotel, I liked watching them go about their lives not knowing that there's a former Nazi parading around. It felt like that Tim Roth movie where he's working as a bellhop. Oh, yeah. I think it was Four Rooms. You meet all these eccentric characters. But in this case, that woman that the night porter is procuring a gigolo for, even she's part of the cabal, the countess. Yeah. Do we ever see her in any of the flashbacks? No, she never... I would like to know what terrible atrocities she committed. I'll bet she had a fight club, basically, but it was old Roman style, so it was definitely in, like, a coliseum, and she made all the uh, victims of the concentration camp fight each other. Oh, and during the intermissions, have that gay ballet dancer do a show. <laughs> well, they're cleaning up the blood and guts, and now a dance. This is my big moment. Yeah, he comes out, and it's, it's my time to shine. But he slips on some blood somewhere, and he'll never forgive Jews for that. <laughs> but just like the larger movie, they have to scoot him off the stage. Okay, okay, that's too long. Get off. <laughs> Get off, yeah. <laughs> I thought the Nazi cabal was a fun detail, that they're holding these mock trials to absolve each other of their war crimes, rationalizing their behavior. I like the two functions that the trials serve. They gather witnesses and evidence that will be disposed of after the trial, and also they get to pretend like they're victims, as they've said in the movie, with a guilt complex that must be cured. <laughs> Despicable. <laughs> Ugh. So as bad as Max is, at least he has some shame. None of the others have shame. Oh, God, they're shame-free. Favorite moment or performance? I thought Max... Did a really good job. You mentioned his previous life experience was able to come into this. 
he felt like the right choice for the center of the movie. And his level of crazy pairs really well with Charlotte Rampling's crazy as Lucia. Yeah, they'd had great on-screen chemistry, even if that chemistry was weird. Toxic? Yeah, volatile. And And they are the central couple that shoulders the entire narrative. Rampling does crazy face like no other in the movie. (laughs) Since I already made reference to Joker, they could have made an interesting Joker-Harley Quinn duet in the 70s together. Um, Yeah, I'd like to see that. Her character... She is alluring at times, but she looks like a viper that's going to strike at any moment. How about a big criticism you have for this film? (laughs) I think we already talked about how much of this movie could have been cut down. Definitely. It felt longer than it was. The pacing was weird. And at some point, I was like, all right, I need to pause this to go to get a sandwich and realize I was only like 20 minutes in. (laughs) <laughs> I could have swore I've been here an hour. <laughs> this movie should be half over. What's going on? We really did experience this and in the mood for love in different ways. We did, yes. <laughs> um, I was going to say I was on the fence about this, but since you didn't like in the mood for love, I'm going to say I hated this movie. I know, John. A part of me was going to put in the mood for love to be the last movie we talk about, just so you wouldn't feel like shooting your barbs at me for no other reason than my honesty. (laughs) (laughs) But here we are. How about some age makeup for the flashbacks at the concentration camp? Yeah. Lucia doesn't look any older in the Vienna scenes, and I think it's important to get across how terrible Max is. Let's remember that he preyed on a teenager. I don't think they ever say exactly how old she was at the camp, but the way he talks about her... Never mind the actress's real age. He talks about her like, maybe she was 14. Do you think she was 18 or 19? She had to be young if she's like, at current age, she's a kept woman by this opera guy. I don't see any Italian man of any age being okay with a woman over 30. (laughs) Uh, Here we go. We're getting into our prejudices (laughs) as Americans. uh, (laughs) Well, well, let me balance that out. Italians, they invented pizza. Uh, (laughs) Kabagoo. And then they topped it with a bunch of underage girls. (laughs) (laughs) Come on, it's Rome we're talking about. (laughs) The Greeks invented the uh, threesome and the Romans added women. (laughs) I have not heard that joke, but I love it. You've never heard that joke before? (laughs) I think I've allowed us to disparage the Italians so much because I don't feel like enough of them are listening to this show. Uh, and we got to get those numbers up. And if it's eight numbers, that's fine. Well, now my favorite part of the show, TLDL, Too Long Didn't Listen. John, I'm going to ask you some rapid-fire questions. Please try to give me short answers. Which film had the most interesting couple? Let's go with The Night Porter. Which movie relies on the romance the most to hold an audience's attention? I'm going to say Je Te Dame. Did I say that right? Not quite, but we'll forgive you. Je Te Uh, You're only making Americans look dumber. I, that's... <laughs> Sacre bleu. <laughs> that's always your go-to expression. <laughs> Playing into stereotypes for a moment like we haven't been this entire episode, which movie would you recommend to men that don't like relationship stories? Probably The Night Porter? What's the bigger tragedy? Never acting on your romantic feelings, seeing your partner the way you want and not the way they are, or engaging in an abusive relationship and knowing it? Oh, I'm going to go with not seeing your partner for who they are. Which film do you think would be the worst idea for a movie night with your significant other? Oh, that's the night porter. (laughs) Yeah, you have experience with this already. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She laughed halfway through. She laughed and took a bath. She's like, I'm out. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I actually... I'll take that. I'll take that as a win. (laughs) (laughs) Which movie do you think 
has the most to pick apart for cinephiles. Oh, that's uh, in the mood for love, sir. Yeah, that's a totally unbiased opinion. Mm -mm. <laughs> and finally, what's the bigger crime? Nazi SS officer or committing anal without a lubricant? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a great joke in there. I'm still saying Nazi SS officer. <laughs>